Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for questions. It's now time for member statements. I recognize the member for Ajax. Here. On February 27, Calgary welcomed athletes from across the country to, Special Olymp to the Special Olympics Winter Games. I am honoured to rise today to recognize Ella Robinson, Alex Capucci, and Rebecca Osmond, three competitors from my constituency of Ajax. The Special Olympics provides athletes with intellectual disabilities an incredible opportunity to showcase their talents and shine in a world that can often be challenging. Through these games, barriers are dismantled and new heights are reached. The accomplishment of these three champions are a testament to this as they collectively brought home a total of nine medals. Ella secured first, second and third place in three race categories. Alex impressed with bronze medals in all four of his speed skating competitions. And Rebecca added to the team's success by placing second in five pin bowling. As we watch Ella, Alex, Rebecca, and all these athletes experience the joy and camaraderie of victory, we are reminded that this event transcends the boundaries of playing field. Mr. Sp Madam Speaker, it is an event that forms a community and fosters friendships that last a lifetime. My heartfelt congratulations to Ella, Alex, and Rebecca for representing Ajax with strength, unity, and determination. A special thank you to Donna Edwards, who has been an amazing coach and leader in Special Olympics for many years. For the member statements, I recognize the member for London North Centre. Speaker, I recently had the opportunity to tour Arcade Street Mission's Cronin Warner site. I'd like to applaud the City of London and all of the phenomenal service and community partners working on the whole of community health and homelessness strategy tables. It was rather cold as we walked down Dundas Street from Arcade's main location, punctuated by our entry into the warm Cronin Warner location. I want to thank the Diocese of Huron and the board at Warner Place for providing the location at a fraction of the market rate to care for the marginalized people in our community. Arcade has served 900 unique people this year. We heard from Rob, who struggled with accessing health care while homeless. He was proud to tell us about his improvements and his future goals. None of this would have happened without Arcade and housing. But fundings for these spaces and others like Safe Space and many more will end on May 31st this year. Homelessness in London will not end on June 1st, Speaker. If funding doesn't flow, 100 dedicated and caring staff will be unemployed. 120 resting places will become vacant, vital and necessary. I was shocked to learn that providers will have to warehouse all the mattresses while people sleep rough. I call on government members to listen to their conscience and fund these beds now. Think of the people who are rebuilding their lives and whose hopes and dreams will be much further away without the basic human necessity of housing. We have the space. We have caring people ready to help. All that is needed is political will. Housing is foundational. Housing is fundamental. Housing is a human right, and housing is health care. Thank you, Speaker. Further member statements, I recognize the member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, Ontario's 2024 budget revealed this government's plan to rebuild the economy while continuing to invest in health care, housing, infrastructure, and more without raising costs for families. In long-term care, the $155 million in funding in 24-25 will allow for continued progression on building 58,000 new and upgraded long-term care homes, long-term care beds across the province, like the completed homes in Carlton Place and Elmont and the Broadview long-term care home in Smith Falls currently under construction. We're investing just over $3 million to assist up to 3,500 people in connecting to primary care in Perth, Ontario, and $4 million to help up to 10,000 people at the Periwinkle site in Kingston. This budget also greenlit the reconstruction of Princess Street in Elmont and the reconstruction of Battersea Road in South Frontenac. Speaker, access to high-speed internet and mobile service is a necessity of modern life. And that's why we're investing $71 million through the Eastern Ontario Regional Network to continue getting more communities online faster than ever before. These are only a few of the highlights of the 2024 budget that is supporting economic growth in Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston and across Ontario. Our government is committed to creating stronger communities for the future, improving Ontario's productivity growth and building prosperity for generations to come. Thank you, Speaker. 
Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. In Ontario, yesterday acknowledgement that interpartner violence is an epidemic, spurred by Ontario's NDP Bill 173, is a step forward. It is encouraging to see the government finally support this recommendation. However, the results must be genuine action, not more delay tactics. Eighteen months ago, I urged the government to review and to act on the Renfrew Triple Femicide Inquest, 86 recommendations to eradicate this violence. Leadership is about facing these truths, and the truth is the government is acting too slowly. This Conservative government has a plan by experts that has been on their desk for over two years. It is concerning that the government committed to an in-depth study. The time for studies is over. The time for action is now. In Niagara, we en endured a tragic femicide only a few months ago, and while we have the best service providers anywhere in the world, they need our help right now. We need immediate, robust solutions, education and training within our criminal justice system, comprehensive and permanent funding, bringing forward an Ontario Clares Law, and securing funding for survivor services. Let us honour those who have suffered and those fighting for change. By by committing to immediate, decisive action on gender-based violence, not another study, and not another delay. I heard that. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. Once again this year, I had the pleasure of attending Halton Industry Education Council's 20th annual Women as Career Coaches Mentorship Event. Congratulations to the team at Hayek for reaching this milestone and for your continued efforts bringing together women and mentors. For 20 years now, this annual event has brought together young people and adult mentors for an impactful, inspiring, and uplifting evening. During the evening, guest speakers share their career journeys and advice with youth who are just starting to think about potential careers. Career coaches sit at tables with young women, engaging in lively conversations, answering questions, and offering encouragement. Throughout the evening, a lineup of inspiring speakers talk about their journeys and career paths, and youth have an opportunity to participate in panel discussion. This evening is designed to the evening is designed to provide the next generation with the opportunity to discover a wide range of potential career paths and perhaps think about new career opportunities. Speaker, working together, we can inspire youth to feel confident and optimistic about their futures and their place in the world of work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the early 1990s, I was a, a teacher, a high school teacher, and I can tell you at that time our schools were well funded, our buildings were well maintained, there was money for sports teams and extracurriculars, there was every, and for special ed, there was a, every child had a textbook for every subject that they took. And then in the early 2000s, when my kids were in school, the, the government of the day started making cuts to schools, and I joined the Toronto Parent Network to fight those cuts. In 1995, the government took control of our education taxes in Toronto, and since then, in almost every year, they've handed the Toronto District School Board a funding shortfall. This year, the funding shortfall is $28 million, and the TDSB trustees are being asked to make drastic cuts to staff programs and services in order to balance the books. But more important than that, there's a $239 million ongoing funding shortfall that for programs that this government is simply not funding, and this includes special education, it includes money for textbooks, it includes money for sports and extracurriculars, and now the TDSB is considering cutting day seniors' daytime programs, they're considering cutting grade six outdoor education trips, and more. This is absolutely reprehensible to be making cuts to our schools, particularly for this generation of students who have survived through the pandemic and need more supports, not less. So I'm calling upon the government today 
to reinstate the funding for the Toronto District School Board and for every school board across this province so that our students do not face another round of cuts. Thank you very much. The member for Scarborough Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to applause the Scarborough Walk of Fame, which has been around for over 20 years. This organization promotes community togetherness and regional distinctiveness by commemorating Scarborough's many well-accomplished icons. The Walk of Fame celebrates Scarborough's rich culture mosaic and inspires future generations by revealing Scarborough's native in the in the deserved domain of art and culture, community, education, environment, entertainment, fitness, health and science, and sports. Additionally, it stimulates economic activity to visitors in Scarborough and surrounding area, contributing to Ontario's repetition as a vibrant and inclusive province. The Scarborough Walk of Fame enhanced the province's culture diversity as a cultural landmark. I would like to thank the chair of the committee, Mr. Glenn de Bearmaker, his colleagues, sponsors, and a strong team of volunteers on the accelerating exhibition of Scarborough Walk of Fame 2024. It was a wonderful, it was wonderful to be there amongst my colleague MPPs and other dignitaries who has seen the showcase of the inductees yesterday. I want to thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to bring this message. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Guelph. Speaker, Guelph's efforts to address homelessness shows what a caring community we are. Shortly after I was elected in 2018, I met with Dominica McPherson, director of the Guelph Wellington Task Force for Poverty Elimination, to strategize how we could implement their vision to end homelessness in Guelph. We started working to bring people together, and I'm proud of the way that all three levels of government, city and county staff, social service agency, private developers, healthcare leaders, community funders, and citizens have worked tirelessly to successfully build three permanent supportive housing projects in five years. The community's efforts culminated with the announcement of operational funding for supportive housing in last month's provincial budget. Securing first capital and then health care funding for supportive housing have been top priorities during my time here at Queen's Park. We have a long way to go to end homelessness, but I want to celebrate the progress we've made by celebrating those people who have got us here. Sheila Markle, Dara Allen Ebron, and Leisha Burley from Kendall Community, Melissa Kowalski and Rochelle Devereaux, Guelph CHC, Kristen Kerr, Stonehenge, Gail Hoekstra, Stepping Stone, Kristen Carney, Wyndham House, Helen Fishburne, CMHA, Emmy Perkins, Guelph OHT, Mark Walton, Guelph General Hospital, Jason Ashdown, Skyline, Glenna Banda, United Way, Chris Willard, Guelph Community Foundation, Louisa Artuzo, Wellington County, Shakiba Cheyenne and Michael Keegan, Guelph Chamber, Mayor Cam Guthrie, MP Lloyd Longfield, and Dominique McPherson, and many others in our community speaker. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, I rise to highlight a crucial initiative that we organize to support the community in understanding the three levels of government in Canada. Richmond Hill is home to a growing number of immigrants who may not have fully comprehend the intricacies of our political landscape as well as the system. We usually do not meet in person, but this time we have it instead of a virtual meeting, we have an in person meeting so that we can facilitate the communications between the speakers and the attendants. Recognizing the challenge, I'm proud to have the April Monday Matters on April 22nd. This is a nonpartisan and educational initiative designed to empower our residents with the knowledge they need to engage effectively in our democracy. This initiative will 
provide a platform for the constituents to learn about the three levels of government and understand the roles and responsibilities. We are honoured to have the former politicians, including former parliamentary secretary and MP for Willowdale, Mr. C.S. Leung, former minister and MPP, Mr. Chris Kilgris, and former mayor of Wichita-Stouffville and chairman of CEO at Rioch Region, Mr. Wayne Emerson, to share the insights. We trust that residents in Richmond Hill will benefit, effectively participate in this democratic process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I recognize the next member, I'm going to ask the members to reduce the volume of their conversations, please. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Perth Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker, for calling the House to order for me this morning. Um, it's wonderful to rise to talk about some important investments that our government is making through our recent provincial budget uh, across Ontario, Speaker. Whether it's the $1.8 billion for housing enabling infrastructure, critical infrastructure to get more homes built across our province, whether it's the $1.2 billion in the Building Faster Fund, $200 million for recreational facilities, Speaker. Over the next 10 years, $15 billion to build new schools, Speaker, doubling the amount of funding for capital this year, Speaker, in our provincial budget for our schools, and of course, $50 billion over the next 10 years for hospitals across this province, Speaker, from Toronto to Windsor to the north and to Ottawa, Speaker. We're investing in Ontario, investing in the people in Ontario. I know it's it was important to see the $50 million for stabilization of health care capacity in our northern rural communities. It was also great to hear that we're going to make the clinical external program permanent, Speaker. I know this is very important to our rural hospitals, Speaker. Speaker, it was also great to see our government continue to build on our investments in primary care. Historic investments, Speaker. Over $500 million will be invested to expand primary care across Ontario to ensure more people can get care closer to home, Speaker. Speaker, unfortunately, all the members of the opposition voted against the provincial government. Speaker, they voted against primary care expansion. They voted against victim quick response program. Speaker, it is shameful. We will continue to stand with the people of Ontario. Thank you very much. That concludes our members' statements for this morning.